Sometimes when you hear people talking about designing new things, it sounds very simple. But sometimes there's a lot of technical challenges that you don't predict. And sometimes it is that simple. So I want to talk about designing couple machines to replace humanly body functions and things people don't think about usually. So first I'll start as a um, ventilators or machines that breathe for you. It's not as simple as just pushing air in and out of the body. The reason why is, if I suck out the air too fast, I can collapse the lung and then it's really hard to inflate. Um, you can kind of think about it as, if you have a balloon and it's partially inflated with air, it's a lot easier to blow more air in. But when it's totally collapsed, it's kind of, it's stuck to itself. It's hard to get air to all those little cracks and crevices. And it's even worse because the lung is actually sticky, it has mucus, and then it's structures that can collapse, and then it can be really hard to refill and maybe even impossible. You also, if you suck out too fast, you can tear up parts of the lung or damage other parts of the lung and membranes permanently. Another thing you could do is if you pump it up too fast, you could tear up parts of the lung too. And if you tear up parts of the lung because you're pumping it up too fast, that's really, really bad. What makes the whole thing even more complicated is different people have different lungs. A baby has a totally different lung capacity than a um, old, than a big dude that is athletic runner or has, or just like endurance athletes. And then you have other things in between, other things to take account because how fast you pump in and out, you can't pump, you have to, it's not only how fast you pump, but how long you pump in or out. You can't pump in too long or you can literally rub the lungs or too short and you don't fill it out as much. But that gets more complicated if you have a sickness that's obstructing the airway so you can't get enough oxygen. And how do you balance it out? Maybe that your normal lung capacity is six liters, but now you only have like three liters because you're severely obstructed. So you have all these calculations to do. And then beyond that, the cycle for, for your lungs goes up and down. It's not a one thing like continuous, like it's always exerting the same sucks and in and same sucks and out. It varies. So people have worked a lot of ways around this. One way around it that people have looked into is um, pumping different amounts, different amounts of oxygen into the axle stream. So if you pump in more oxygen, then you don't need to pump in as fast or, or as much. It's much force because oxygen can get exchanged better. Simply because there's more oxygen. If you have twice the amount of oxygen, the exchange rate for oxygen, you need about twice as less amount of air. A very rough approximation. Okay, so this sounds great. You fix it with oxygen, but having too much oxygen in your body or too much CO2 or too little CO2 or too little oxygen is also a problem in place because oxygen can is reactive. It's what we use to burn stuff and it can damage a bunch of cells. It can stimulate inflammation. Too much oxygen has been known for not very well-known mechanisms, but it somehow can cause seizures and it can cause irregular nerve rhythms and all these other things. It's known to increase aging, risk of cancer heart, and it can lead to your um, alkalosis where your body comes to alkaline, the blood in your body. Too much CO2 can make your blood too acidic and can start dissolving minerals and also interfere with nerves in the body, but not in as negative as too much oxygen. Too much CO2 can also cause a um, panic response where you start hyperventilating or breathing faster, which you can't do, which might damage your lungs or your heart, other parts of the body. And the sensors all of your body that detect this, so it does it right. Now, the actual mechanical equipment oftentimes is pretty simple, I would say. I, I mean, I could probably design it with some household parts. It's just the controls for it that have to be really complicated to measure the CO2, the oxygen level. It has to balance it with people's needs because sometimes you need more oxygen, sometimes 
you need less oxygen depending on what's going on. So you have to have all these sensors and stuff. And all these sensors are getting better and better. And I wouldn't say that the sensors are even that expensive with newer tech, but boy are the controls fancy to figure out the best optimum. And the problem is that people don't, is these big companies that make these devices don't really give out the information about how to um, make the best device with the best controls for oxygen, for CO2 and everything and pressure and rhythms. Yeah, and if we did, we might also learn how better treat other diseases because giving CO2, excess CO2 is actually a treatment that's been shown to be effective against epilepsy um, and certain things and seizures. It's also been shown, the opposite of giving extra oxygen has been shown to reduce some migraines. And I'll link the sources below for that. So beyond th that, what about pumping blood through the body? Simple, right, um, a heart lung machine. But first of all, if you're designing any heart machine or dialysis, I'm not also clean, cl clean, clean up blood, you have to figure out where to put the machine into the body that you get a lot of blood, but you don't cause a bleeding problem or damage, which might be hard if it's a, uh, because like the major arteries are probably the perfect place, but that's gonna be a very damaging procedure with a lot of cuts. Less of a problem if your patient's in like a coma or really sick and stuck in bed. Still a problem. <clears throat> so how do you, so first of all is the connection. Then when the, you connect it, there's a teens in temperature when you take the blood outside the body and put it in. This change of temperature can be quite significant. There's also change in pressure. And this can cause a couple of things. So this is a whole website about the temperature with dialysis, but it also comes with this pumping blood. And if it, um, if I take the, if the blood cools down a lot outside the body, your body has to reheat it, which means your body uses up a lot of energy that needs to fight off the pathogen or just function and that can cause a lot of stress on the body which can really significantly hurt the body because the way that your body produces heat is not the same way your body produces energy and it produces a lot more toxins the way your body produces energy is more of a controlled process where it produces heat it's more like actually burning it where there's a lot of smoke like when you burn something there's a lot of extra energy there's smoke there's um random chemicals and you can see it when you, your body produces energy it's more like a contained reaction like a battery it's very very complicated and has all these controls when it's producing energy so you have more toxins and more energy if it's too hot your body has to spend a lot of energy cooling it down and there's other effects there's some um of showing that if it's too hot what can ha can happen is um your proteins can unfold, and this can also happen if it's too cold. So your proteins have a certain structure, and it's held together by a bunch of different things. When it's too hot, the structure can start falling apart. It's like if you shake a building and you shake it too much, heat is like shaking, a build, shaking something. If you shake something too much, it just falls apart. Now, if something used to be shaking a certain amount, and there's nothing, it might also kind of fall apart or change shapes because it might just have a more stable thing. Like, um, it might just actually collapse in itself because it just, everything is pulling together instead of just spreading out. So both ways are bad. And what's worse is if it goes hot to cold, hot to cold, because then it just randomly, it gets, it collapses, then it stands back up, then it collapses and stands back up and it just gets all messed. and. This is what we do in cooking to take something and turn it into something else with proteins. You can see with eggs especially, but meat, eggs and meat is what does it a lot and how it totally changes stuff. Not as dramatic, but it can have a really health effect, especially if you're on dialysis a long time. A lot of people on dialysis have a bunch of diseases because of um, the reheating and cooling of the blood continuously causes all these proteins to unfold. It might cause chronic diseases afterwards and build 
And these proteins sometimes can unfold other proteins and cause a cascade, which is known as prion diseases. And prion diseases are, that are known are Alzheimer's, Parkinson, Crutchfield Jacob, mad cow disease, and a bunch of other ones. So these are very serious illnesses in the most extreme case. Also, there's other stresses that can just destroy the molecule. If, if you, um, in a dialysis machine, we take out chemicals like salt and other toxins. But when you take it out, there's a sudden change in the environment. The pH can go up or down suddenly. But also, um, something called um, the osmotic pressure becomes different. And osmotic pressure, if it goes up or down, can also cause proteins and stuff to fold or unfold. So I'm going to show you an osmotic pressure cell, but it works with proteins too. If there's two, if there's, there's a lot of salt around the cell, of protein, it sucks the water out nearby away from the protein, and the protein, just like a cell, can collapse. And if it's too much, it can stretch out. If there's too much water compared to salt and other stuff, and clean everything dissolved, the protein actually expands just like a cell and can get damaged in that way. Also, salt is important to stabilizing proteins in a variety of ways. Um, and all these other things. Salts have charges, which can um, neutralize charges on proteins and help stuff interact differently. But all this happens just when there's a... Now, these are toxins that we filter on dialysis, but if we fill out too quickly, that's when the cell proteins can't survive and they blow up or something. It's like, how would I... It's like if I slowly... If I, if I put my... If I put my fist against a wall with all my force, but I slowly put the force on it, the wall is not going to break. If I punch it suddenly with all my force, it's going to break. If you hit something suddenly, it's going to break. If you pull something suddenly, it's going to break much more than if you do it slowly often. And it seems with these pressure gradients, the pressure in the system can change a lot. This means that um, we have a huge problem with dialysis and um, pumping up blood out of the water, but also this happens with, again, with the putting oxygen in the body. And if we just put rapidly oxygen outside the body, rapidly in. And the reason why it doesn't happen in the body as much is because the body has more of an equal temperature, it has better controls, but also we have much more surface area. This means that stuff happens much more slowly along a slow path. So if, if you try to pull out all the salt, excess salt in like one in like a one centimeter long tube, you have to pull it out a lot faster than if you do it in a 500 centimeter tube. Your body has, if you your lungs have a incredible amount of surface area, your livers, your kidneys, they all have an incredible amount of surface area, and I'll slowly pull it out. Well, these machines outside the body pull out relatively quickly. Maybe in the future we'll solve these problems, but it's just not as simple as filtering it out is what I'm saying. Now, okay, so we have all those problems. Now, what's one of the last problems that I'm going to mention here that we haven't solved? Is we haven't been able to make a simple heart inside to outside the body because of many reasons. One of, the, one of them is that we need to make something with a pulse as far as we're aware of. And it's not as simple as a continuous pump. A continuous pump is a lot easier to design than something that pulses. And why is pulsing important? And also if you pump blood outside, if the blood comes outside the body, it loses some of the pressure and energy because you have to pump it outside and out. It's a harder path. It's like adding extra plumbing, which slows it down and also messes up your pulse because it slows down and that messes up the blood flow. Well, it seems that your pulse helps push force blood into the tiniest little parts of your body and nutrients because it adds a little burst of extra pressure while not adding too much extra pressure all the time. Then it helps 
when the when it contracts, it helps suck up that stuff at the same time. So it helps to, to um, keep the balance better. Not only does it keep the balance better, it also seems that it prevents blood cells from sticking together, preventing blood clots. Um, and it also, with fluid dynamics that's really complicated, it seems there's a turbulence in blood. And turbulence is like, is like water spinning anywhere, or is it flowing chaotic, is the splashing, or we, other movements. It affects that turbulence, so it lowers turbulence in ways that would cause blood to clot. Artificial heart valves also have a blood clotting problem because they don't move like regular heart valves fully in the same smooth manner, and they cause more turbulence, but also causes more blood clotting. So what do I think may be some solutions in the future for this? Well, one would be to make more open source data for the design of all these devices um, so people can actually learn the controls. Another one would be um, designing They've started design plastics that shrink and stuff when you apply uh, electric force to them. They're kind of like muscles, or it can grow artificial organs. But less advanced is like for dialysis, it would be um, better insulated um, pipes and piping and everything that keeps the temperature at a better controlled value. And sometimes you do actually want the temperature to be extra high because that can kill some pathogens or toxins, extra cold, but it's a very specific thing. You could also, beyond that, you could design higher surface area materials nowadays so it's not as rapid taking up with special manufacturing. Now, that could include this, um, putting in the molds with a higher surface area, blowing it, 3D printing, a bunch of things, but these technologies are out there, but they just need a heavy investment and something that people are not too interested in investing in for some reason, because it doesn't make as much money as a blockbuster drug. It's a tool that is used a lot and everything. You know, could, you could argue it impacts more people because more people are on all these different machines and ever will be on drugs. But then the approval process and everything is just as complicated. Another thing we could do is, I think if we can design a better way of getting some oxygen to the blood, blood, that's, blood that is harmless, not harmless, but less bad than ventilators. We could use it instead as a ventilator where you breathe on your own, but you have a booster somewhere, like a blood oxygen machine booster that's not directly hooked up to your heart or something, but maybe hooked up to a major artery in your leg or something, depending on the need. And if it's coming more directly to the heart, if you really need a big boost, you would have to really design it well, and you would, but I think it's totally possible, and you might do a lot of prevent you with a lot of the miscalculation with the damage to lungs by the pressure because you don't have to push the lungs as hard in and out and you don't have to um, put as much extra uh, excess oxygen in. There's also a thing that we might think that um, actually the oxygen is breathing ventilation device for you might weaken the lungs because you're not using your own muscles. So there's that too in interaction. But these are all things to think about in the future. And I hope you found this interesting. Please like, please like and subscribe to my channel. Sorry, my mouth is getting a little tired. Um, please also share it with your friends and leave a comment behind if you have, have any future suggestions, questions, or ideas, or want to say any comments. Also, feel free to DM me if you have my DMs, but I just don't want to give it out to everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye.